I became a POW, and uh, that was a very humbling, frustrating experience for me. I, one of the worst things that could have happened that I was taken out of combat by the great men I've been training with all this time, and they going on to combat without me. And I never got over that for many, many years. You didn't want to be in a Japanese military prison. So, you know, you lose weight very quickly. And when you've got amoebic dysentery uh, and malaria and beriberi, beriberi, the water accumulates in your lower extremities. They swell up. You can take your thumb and put it in and say a puka, you know. Uh, you can't walk very far. But then again, I wasn't doing any walking. I, didn't, I couldn't walk at all. I was in the damn cell. My prayers changed from why me to show me. And I quit saying why me, God, and I started saying show me, God. How can I use this positively? Help me to use it to go home as a better, stronger, smarter man in every possible way that I can, to go home as a, as a better naval officer, to go home as a better American, a better citizen, a better... Navy pilot, a, a better Christian, uh, every possible way God help me to use this time productively so that it won't be some kind of a void or a vacuum in my life. And after, after that change in my prayers, every single day took on a new meaning. Former state land director William Patey, retired Hawaii Supreme Court Associate Justice Frank Paget, and retired U.S. Navy Captain Jerry Coffey all survived ordeals as prisoners of war. On this compilation edition of Long Story Short, we look back at these previous Long Story Short guests and see how they never really stopped believing that they would come home alive. Courage and Captivity, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. While prisoners of war may be valuable commodities to their captors, that does not mean they'll be well treated or survive. Sir Winston Churchill observed that courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. This can most certainly be said of our three long story short guests. We begin with William Woods Patey Jr., better known as Bill. In 1945, he left college to join the army and become a paratrooper. He soon found himself on the ground in Normandy, France on D-Day, fighting in one of the most famous battles of World War II. We dropped six miles further inland than we were supposed to, and then on top of that, we dropped right on top of a German parachute regiment that had been training right in that area. Yeah, it wasn't a comfortable landing, you yeah. know. What happened when you landed? Well, uh, I ran into a French milkmaid uh, early on, milk, and some of you have heard that story that she was D-Day morning, all this firing's going on. We've had skirmishes all night long from midnight, and uh, you could hear the big shells from the Navy cruisers outside, off, offshore coming in. The spitfires and all were all over the place. She's milking a cow in the middle of the hedgerow. And I walk over, uh, I tell my sergeant, I did it very quickly, uh, we didn't know exactly where they were and where the Germans were, and I go to give them my best Pinot French. Il y a des bœufs, je suis un Américain officier, il a des éléments près d'ici. It's supposed to be where the Germans are around here. She doesn't change, she milks a cow. And, uh, but she moves her head like this, and I look, and there's a German patrol coming down the road just above us. <laughs> so I, I uh, jump up and jump back over the hedgerow, but I think I told my sergeant that uh, I think I'm going to get us a date tonight. <laughs> so I, said, I said, Captain, you didn't do too good, did you? <laughs> you have a date with a German yeah, regiment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I became a POW. And uh, it was a very humbling, frustrating experience for me. I, one of the worst things that could have happened that I was taken out of combat by the great men I've been training with all this time. And they going on to combat without me. I never got over that for many, many years. What were conditions like for you as a POW? Well, it's, it's, nothing's good about being a POW. Uh, the Germans, in terms of handling their officers, uh, POWs were more lenient than they were with the enlisted. But uh, 
uh, said, by and large, uh, if they went hungry, we went hungry. Uh, but it, it could have been worse. I think the worst part was being transported in 40 boxcars, 40 by eight boxcars, all jammed in together. Uh, all, and then they shipped us up for, across France and into Germany. And every time you had a marshalling yard, they changed engines. And then the Spitfires or the uh, P-47s would come down, and the sirens would go off. And there you are locked in this boxcar, you know. And that, that, that got to be a little wearing. <laughs> Did you worry that they'd kill you? The, 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 As the, a POW? No, no, they, they were... Uh, or torture you? Uh, no, we didn't get any treatment like that. But if you try to get away, they, they, don't, they don't get very happy about that. You tried to get away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What'd you try? Well, first of all, coming down out, out of, after I was wounded, uh, they put me in an ambulance. and. Uh, the spits came down, the spitfires came down and shot up the, the, uh, the buses we were in that were wounded. And so the Germans would jump, the guys would jump out and get in the ditch. If you climbed out of the, try to get out of the, the bus, they get shot. If you stayed there, you got strafed. So <laughs> in, the, in the process, the, when the bus got caught fire, and I scrambled out somehow. I was, I was ambulatory and got away and, and hung up, uh, got to, uh, with, with some um, a French farmer. And uh, they took me up into the, put the way up in the little attic they had up there. But uh, uh, they were going to get the French resistance guys to come in and help take me up. But as it turned, uh, turned out, the, a German artillery unit came in there and set it up as a, as a command post. And they searched the place, and there I was. So that wasn't too bad. They just put me back into the bus. And they, they didn't discipline no, you? No, 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 not that. I was just, they, they were too busy doing that. Uh, it's after that, the uh, second time was, was kind of a bad one. What happened the second time you tried well, to get away? Well, the second time I got out was a, out of a discharge from a German hospital. And uh, they had a compound there, and uh, we, uh, they had the real you know, barbed wire around the wall. And, and what had you been treated for? What was, what oh, was your I, wound? I had, I had a uh, uh, Schmeiser bullet in my groin. Oh. It's still there, by the way. And uh, they never took it out. But uh, be that as it may, uh, I decided that, that, that we want to try to see if we get out. Now, I guess there are uh, several dozen, a uh, full 50 or 60 were in the compound that had been pulled together. We had an idea that four of us would get out and make a break for it. Uh, and uh, but when the time came, there were only two of us, uh, one an Englishman and myself. So we did, did the... the, the we went out and with the blankets at, at night, and they had they had the watchtowers, but the lights didn't go on all the time. Uh, we uh, uh, threw the blankets over, climbed over the barbed wire, and got down the, the dark white over the next one. And it, it, it gets kind of touchy there, because you're not sure the light's going to come on. They're going to use the machine gun. So we got over, and we it was getting close to dawn by then. Were you cut up by the barbed wire? Uh, we had gloves uh, we'd gotten, and we also had blankets, so not too bad. So we got it, and we hightailed it off through uh, across the field. And I guess after we'd gone a few miles, uh, we decided we'd better try to hole up. And uh, so we holed up in a cow shed. And, and again, uh, a French lady came by, and we gave her our best charming <laughs> little French again. She said, man, no, wait, wait, wait. I was going to get help. She comes back, come back with four Germans and two police dogs. <laughs> so, so for that Purohu French show. Uh... <laughs> it didn't did work out too well. <laughs> but it was uh, that we got solitary time for that. You know. But nothing, I mean, solitary was the worst of it? So I don't know. They didn't try to. They didn't. It was. They. They. Geneva Convention was observed quite well by them. They. Didn't. But um, they got bed and water and, and no light. It gets, uh, gives oh. you a lesson. Yeah. Bill Patey didn't give up trying to escape, and on his third try, he succeeded and made his way safely back home. On the other side of the world, Frank Paget, a U.S. Air Force pilot, was captured and held prisoner for eight months by the Japanese military police. After losing an engine to enemy fire, he and his crew had to bail out. He was 21 years old. When we bailed out, we weren't sure where we were because the navigator had lost 
uh, when we were on the deck stuff, he hadn't taken times and stuff, and he couldn't, because the engine was windmilling, that, that propeller, he couldn't use his uh, instruments, so we didn't know where we were. We were over, you know, we were, turned out we were northwest of Hanoi. So did you fall into friendly hands at first or not? No. Well, y yes and no. I was trying to walk out to China, you know, I didn't know what the hell to do. We, we didn't know that the French were alerted. Or the French had a thing that when they found an American plane was down, they'd go out and walk up and down the roads whistling Tipperary. Nobody ever told us that. That was a sign that there was a friendly person, yeah, come yeah. show yourself. Okay. okay. Did you hear Tipperary and not respond? No, 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 I didn't. Uh, about the second day, I was walking on a pathway between Rice, and I looked and there were all these Vietnamese following me. So I stopped and uh, I spoke enough French and they spoke enough so that they asked me if I was hungry and I went back to their village and uh, they fed me and uh, the Japanese arrived and I tried to run out of the village. I got outside but it was surrounded. Fortunately, I'd laid down my pistol while I was resting and I didn't have it so I didn't try to shoot it out so I lived. <laughs> you laugh about it now. Wait, you you not only got uh, captured by the Japanese, but you you were put in the control of the Nazi Gestapo equivalent of the Japanese forces. Yeah, that's the that's the Kempi Tai. The Kempi Tai was a combination of uh, military police and Gestapo, which is a kind of a bad combination. But you know, fortunately the jail in Shalom was more or less was really military police and the jail downtown was regular Kempi Tai. That's where you'll see the name Nix and the other name in uh, July of uh, 45. I'm in a French prison camp. This B-24 B B-24s from uh, the Seventh Air Force raided Saigon. A plane got hit. You could see it. Kind of, you know, you're out in a slit trench watching your American plane go over and listening to the bombs whistle. They, you know, they whistle when they come down. Uh, anyway, these two guys bailed out. And the Kempi Tai got them when they cut their heads off. And I'm being treated in accordance with the Geneva Convention. <laughs> they beat you and you're back in the cell. And you know they're coming back and they're gonna do it again. And it really bothers you, you know. And then they take you out and they take you back and the first time they hit you, that's it, you know, they've done the, that they've done it, and, you know, they're gonna hit you some more, that, that, that's it, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. I was really um, intrigued by this quote in your book with your son. Um, it's, the, it's from an unknown person, but it says, um, to a prisoner of war, the enemy is everywhere. He controls your fate, your future, even your bodily functions. You're at war at every second. You're never given leave, and you can never leave the combat zone. Is that what it felt like? Uh, in the Kempi Tai jail, yes. You're always on alert. Well, uh, yeah. It was a little different. They were starving us to death, okay? We wore a breech cloth. We had a blanket, a tatami, a rice husk pillow, and a, at the six by eight cell, the lights were always on. Uh, they came and stared through the thing. But, you know, human beings are human beings. One of the guards <laughs> was 
from a dairy farm in Japan, and the only thing he was interested in was getting back to Japan. So they would come and talk to you. And they weren't supposed to in, our camp, in, in that jail. They were not supposed to, but they did anyway. So that was a nice bit of humanity yeah. you could share. You know, I notice when you talk about being a prisoner of war, as awful as it was, you, you laugh. Did you have that sense of humor when you were there? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of a dark humor. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's, I think that might be resilience too. Well, uh, probably, but you know, what are you gonna do? You can't do anything about the circumstances. So, you know, try to see the, if you can find anything good, okay, you know. Uh, there wasn't in that jail. The best thing that happened was every two or three days you got to carry the chamber pot out and dump it in the sewer. That was your excursion, right? Yeah. Now, you had become a Catholic when you were 13 or 14. Did, did that faith kick in or was that helpful to you I at this learned, time? I, I, I said to Hail Mary, the, I said the rosary on my knuckles every day and I prayed that I get released. It, God apparently moves at his own speed. It took a while. <laughs> Frank Paget was released from prison and sent back home when the war ended. He later served as a justice in Hawaii's highest court. Just over 20 years later, the United States was involved in another overseas war, this time in Vietnam. Navy Captain Gerald Coffey, better known as Jerry Coffey, also was a pilot. He spent seven years and nine days in a North Vietnamese prison after his plane was shot down. I had to eject at very, very high speed, and the airplane was totally out of control, rolling rapidly. So when I pulled the face curtain, it was about 680 miles per hour. And you can kind of imagine the impact hitting the airstream at 680. I say, you know, it's like going down H1 in your convertible with the top down and standing up in the front seat <laughs> at 600 miles an hour. So, um, and I was knocked unconscious immediately, but regained consciousness floating in the water and already some Vietnamese, small Vietnamese boats and, and militiamen and, and army guys were there and, and they was, I was captured immediately. Right after I was captured, some airplanes from the Kitty Hawk, the, the carrier that I was operating from, showed up and they see the, the boats there and they see my life preserver and the die marker out here and they think the boats are still on the way out to pick me up. And so they figured, well, if they strafe the boats, they won't, they won't be able to get me, but I, they didn't know I was already in the boat. So these two A-1 aircrafts strafe the boats that we're in and I'm watching the bullets rack at the side of the boat. The Vietnamese stood up and in the boats and returned their own, their fire with their own, own weapons. And we got to the beach finally and jumped out and ran across a wide sandy beach and dove behind a rice paddy dike to take cover just about the same time that an A-4 Skyhawk from the Kitty Hawk rolled in and fired a pack of rockets, which blew all those beach boats to splinters. That was my introduction to North Vietnam. My, sometime in that battle, my crewman was killed. Uh, he was my navigator, and I never saw him again and kept asking all, all through the prison experience, you know, about him, have you seen my, have you seen my, my crewman? And uh, nobody ever had, and, and his remains returned here through Hickam in the late 80s, as a matter of fact. So, and I found myself a, a prisoner of war, a POW, and it takes a while to, to get, to, to, we used to say, so that when you get to know the ropes, but the ropes were how they tortured us. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, I mean, uh, you know, I think people are very interested in, in the torture part, because we all think, could we have withstood that? How, what would that be like? I mean, just the, the, the mental agony of never knowing when it was going to happen yes. or what it was going to entail. And uh, early on, there's this uh, really vivid scene that, that you describe in your book where you were with your broken arm and a, I think a shattered elbow, you were tied up uh, with your a arms tree. and back. That's right, to a tree. And yeah. to a tree. And you, essentially, you became, it was, you became a game of tetherball to yes, some exactly. Vietnamese the on the ground. Yes, exactly. The tree was on a hill and they, the guards kept pushing me downhill and all the weight was on my, on my arms. Uh, I was tied to a, up a branch of the tree. <clears throat> and I didn't, I was so naive. I mean, I was a professional naval officer, military officer, and I didn't even realize it didn't really register to me that I was being brutally tortured at the time. It wasn't until I had a chance to kind of catch my breath and lay on a stack of hay in this stable, which was near in this little village in, in central North Vietnam. And 
I just realized, oh, God, I've just been tortured. At one point, your your broken arm was was sort of encased in inflammation of swelling, which acted like a sort of cast. It, it was, was an untreated broken arm. It was an untreated broken arm, and and my and my hand swelled up, and I couldn't get the red hot ring I was wearing on my finger off. So they they put me in interrogation one night and, and sliced my finger open and pulled the ring off after they squeezed the, the blood and the lymph out. And then the next night they took me to a military hospital and set my arm and all the swelling went down. And they could have just taken the ring off. And they did a reasonably good job on my arm, and it was about as good as they did for their own people. So, but they, but they, they wanted to keep us in presentable shape, at least, to be propaganda vehicles. You had to be so strong. I mean, you were in this tiny little cell. It was just filthy and unsanitary, and you never knew when you were going to get called into the next session. Exactly. And everything, and be, as you described that cell, you, you, you always, everything that happened to you got infected because of the environment in which we were living. And, um, but an infection could have killed you. Yeah, it could have, and did kill some men. The toilet was a, a bucket without a, bucket a cover right there, in this yeah, very small right, space, right. and you exercised in that tiny little space. Right. How many miles a day did you walk? Three at miles. Three a, steps at a time. <clears throat> three miles a day, three steps at a time. One of the first things you do when you moved into a new cell, and the cells did vary sometimes in size, but you'd walk it off <clears throat> and see many, how many laps it had to be for a mile. And you go get your exercise, and you do push-ups on your on those concrete bump and bunks, and and stay in as good a shape as possible, because you never knew the next day was going to require. In, in some cases, guys were forced to march northward towards the Chinese border to a new prison. They weren't hauled up there by trucks; they had to march. So you had to, st and, and the images of the the marches, march of Corregidor in in World War II in the Philippines comes to mind, where they, if you if you fell behind, you got killed. And so we try to stay in as good a physical shape as possible. What are some of the um, attributes that you think made each of those who, who survived and, and later did well in life? What, what were some of the common attributes that you, sh you all shared? I think optimism. And, and it, it costs no more to be an optimist than it does a pessimist. And, and it's a lot happier way to live your life, I think. But those who were the most optimistic and, and, and could translate that optimism to faith or through faith, I think that they were the ones that were able to make the most of the experience and learn the most and be able to make the biggest contribution because of the experience after we returned. I think that um, guys who uh, were mechanically minded also that could be inventive and, and guys came up with some of the most remarkable things, not the least of which was learning how to put our, our sandals to balance them on the edge of the top of the, of the bucket to sit down on the sandals instead of the edge of the bucket. I mean, a toilet seat. <laughs> how, how come I didn't figure this out earlier? You know, what a veritable breakthrough. luxury. <laughs> what a breakthrough, you know. But but and and also because most of us were aviators, and and there's something uh, I have to say. There's something about military aviation that that uh, is kind of a a winnowing process, and uh, we're all college graduates because you had to graduate from college to get your wings, whether it be Air Force or Navy. So we're all better educated and had an appreciation for the things that you could learn by yourself, by just going inward and thinking about yourself and thinking about the world and thinking about what you, what the future might you hold. You couldn't be afraid to face yourself and a lot of people have trouble with that. Exactly, exactly. Jerry Coffey wasn't released from prison until the end of the war in 1973. He stayed in the Navy until he retired a dozen years later. He became a national commentator on political and military issues, a motivational speaker, and a columnist. Despite lingering health problems from their captivity, Bill Patey, Frank Padgett, and Jerry Coffey went on to have full lives. Mahalo to these men for their heroic service to our country and for the inspiration and life lessons we gain from your courage in captivity. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha, ahuiho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. They call her name and walk across in front of this guy. He said, you know, 
you do not need to accept repatriation. You may stay in our country if you'd like. What? Get out of here, you know. Walk over and salute Colonel Abel and shake his hand, and then this big Air Force uh, major put his arm around my, my, my shoulder and said, come on, Commander, I'll take you out to the airplane. And we walk up. We're going up the ramp of the C-141, and at the top of the ramp, there are four, I'm sure, hand-selected gorgeous Air Force nurses. <laughs> Go up there and hug them. You know, they smelled so good. <laughs> Got magazines and newspapers and hot coffee and donuts and so on, and we're all chattering away there. And finally, get the last guys aboard, and the pilot comes up with the intercom and says, come on, guys, let's strap in. We're ready to go. And it got quiet. And we're all thinking, wow, is this going to be it? So we strap in and cranks up those engines on the airplane. We're taxiing out toward the runway. He gets on the runway, runway and revs up the engines at full, full throttle and holding the brakes back. And, and he finally releases the brakes and we're rolling down this kind of rough runway. And we're all stranded against our straps here. Come on, you beast, get airborne, get airborne. Come on, let's go. We go down to pick up speed and the nose comes up and then we hear that hydraulic whine of the, the wheels going up into the wheel where the wells and clunk up in there. And we're climbing on out and the pilot comes up and says, congratulations, gentlemen, we're just leaving North Vietnam. And then we believed it. And then we cheered.